This is a revamp of a program that I gave about 10 years ago now, unbelievably, um, concerning a topic which a lot of us have encountered. Maybe we didn't always know what we were looking at, but in the 19th and the 18th century and before, illegitimacy was a real social stigma attached, and it prevents you oftentimes from making clear connections intergenerationally. Um, there were lots of legal disabilities surrounding it, and this program sort of outlines the genesis of bastardy law and the kinds of records that are generated by it, so that at least in some terms, records can assist in identifying paternity for a child who was born out of wedlock. If you would like to know more about this topic and get a little bit more in-depth coverage than you will get through this presentation, at the same time that I created this um, slideshow, I also wrote an article that was published in the North Carolina Genealogical Journal with the same title. It is published in volume 39, number one, in 2013. Let's start tonight with a torrid story of romantic entanglement, betrayal, and triumph, shall we? It's a little tidbit like you might find among the records of almost any 18th or 19th century court. It all begins with the discovery of a 13-year-old girl named Henrietta L. McCrae, living in the household of Captain Duncan McCrae of the courthouse town of Lawrenceville in Montgomery County, North Carolina. Henry married Henrietta married Jesse Smitherman Spencer in 1858, and shortly thereafter, she and her husband moved to the budding city of Charlotte, shortly after the Civil War. There, her husband became a very powerful man in the budding textile industry. In fact, he named the Henrietta Mills after her. She died in 1918, and in the next slide, we will see the impressive monument that she and her husband share in Elmwood Cemetery in Charlotte. Now, it's not surprising that Henrietta would make a brilliant marriage. Captain Duncan McRae was a land speculator. He owned a store and a hotel in the town of Lawrenceville and later in Troy when the county seat moved there. He owned plantations and enslaved people. He had an interest in gold mines and his children were well-respected members of the community. What is strange is that I could not place Henrietta specifically within his family. For instance, when he died in the middle of the year 1850, just after the census was taken, Henrietta is not listed among his heirs in the estate file. So it's clear that she was not his daughter, nor could she be a granddaughter through a deceased child. Yet, she is mentioned in the wills of two of Duncan's bachelor sons much later, William H. McRae in the 1890s and Captain Duncan A. McRae in the 1880s. Neither will specifies exactly how she, she is related to them, but they each gave her substantial bequests. Now, neither of these, un uh, these men in the family, these unmarried brothers, had children, and the heirs of each were siblings, nieces, and nephews. An examination of Henrietta's death certificate revealed something curious. Henrietta's son-in-law gave the name of her father on her death certificate as W. M. McRae, deceased, and her mother as Regina McRae, deceased. Well, Regina R. McRae, was definitely the oldest daughter of Captain Duncan McRae, but she had clearly never been married to a W. M. McRae or to anybody else, and she spent her entire life as a postmistress in Troy, helping to manage the hotel that her family ran there. This was something of a mystery to me. I confess that I was a bit naive about what could be happening here. I just knew that someone wasn't telling the whole truth. At first, I think I nearly gave up knowing anything for certain. 
the public records of Montgomery County were destroyed in a series of courthouse fires, the last one happening in 1843, some six years after Henrietta's birth. But I was in for a surprise. As a general strategy to help with McRae family research, and because it was a burned county, I decided to search the files of the state Supreme Court for any surviving appeals from the lower courts in which McRae's were parties. There is a card index in the search room at the State Archives arranged by last name of plaintiff or defendant which allowed me to do this. When I saw a case entitled McRae v. Lilly, I knew I was on to something because the Lilly name was common in Montgomery County. I pulled the case file and learned some very interesting details about Regina R. McRae. Apparently, this was an issue in which Duncan McRae of Lawrenceville brought suit for $10,000 against a young man named Henry Lilly, who had boarded in his hotel for some six or seven years. Regina, as Duncan's oldest daughter, then about age 17, oversaw the slaves as they cleaned and maintained the rooms and saw to the needs of the guests. In April of 1836, Lily supposedly seduced Regina in his own room, and the testimony is very explicit, that she continued to visit him there for some time afterwards until he left in October or November. Subsequently, she found that she was pregnant and gave birth to the child in January 1837, and this is just the date given by Henrietta's death certificate. It would appear that Duncan McRae was suing Lily on the grounds that he had gotten his daughter with child, and because of this, he had been deprived of her labor during her confinement and was entitled to damages. Lily, in his defense strategy, attempted to show that Duncan McRae was a negligent father, and that the daughter was a wanton young woman given to visiting other young men in their rooms. Such evidence was intended to mitigate the damages, because if he could be proven as a negligent parent, Duncan would have then contributed to the situation which led to his losses. All the usual filth poured out of witnesses' mouths about Regina, blackening her name even further. Among the accusations was that she was seen sitting behind a young man on a horse in the late afternoon, and that she was seen with the same young man sitting on a bridge with his hand placed inappropriately on her shoulder. In the end, the case had to be removed to another jurisdiction because prejudices just ran so high in Montgomery County about these folks. So it was moved to Cabarrus County, and when $1,600 in damages were awarded to McRae in 1840 by Cabarrus Superior Court, Mr. Lilly appealed to the state Supreme Court. In the end, McRae got his damage award, and to his credit, he gave the money to his daughter, she is shown as owning $1,925 worth of real estate in the 1850 census. When Duncan McRae fell into debt just before his death, she loaned him about $1,000 and later demanded that it be repaid to her. It was her insurance policy against an unforgiving world, and she managed well with it, investing in properties that would benefit herself and her child. I was gratified when I noticed that she had boldly named her child for its father, Henrietta L. for Lily McRae. Henrietta's case is typical in some ways and atypical in others. Clearly, here is an instance in which a family was very ashamed of an illegitimate birth. The social stigma was very high. The family certainly invented tales, especially when it came to the information passed down to descendants to conceal the truth. Also, in this case, as in so many others, the mother, Regina, paid a price. Her reputation was definitively undermined in merciless court proceedings, and she was never able to find a husband or start a normal family life after that. What is atypical about Henrietta as an unwed mother was her station in life and the commitment of her family to her well-being. 
On both sides, she came from the better sort of her community, and she married well. Uh, that is the daughter, Henrietta. This was not typical of illegitimate children and speaks to her mother's ambitions for her. Also, she and her mother were not abandoned by her McRae relatives. They continued to care for her, and they left her bequests in their wills, including in her uncle Duncan's case, large tracts of land in Texas, even though she had absolutely no legal right to any inheritance at all. Now, from what I've said, it should be apparent to you that the lot of natural children was not an easy one. And it really hadn't been since the middle of the 11th century in England. Legal prejudice ran high against irregular sexual relationships and the offspring of those relationships who were dubbed illegitimate. In fact, I could find very few words to use in this presentation that aren't considered pejorative words when employed in everyday speech. Words like bastard, misbegotten, illegitimate, misborn, baseborn, None of these are very flattering terms, and they reflect deep-seated attitudes in the English tradition. The best we can do, really, is born out of wedlock, natural child, reputed child, supposed child. But even these last two reflect the questionable status of alleged relationships, particularly to the father. I mean, after all, before blood testing and DNA testing, there was no way to show who the father was scientifically or even to narrow down the possibilities. Maternity is obvious, but paternity has to be proven. These children were made to suffer on purpose by society for the mistakes of their parents, usually for one of three reasons. One, as an incentive for adults to contract legally sanctioned marriages. Two, so that the descent of heritable property would be protected from unforeseen challenges by mystery heirs. Number three, so that the parishes and counties would not have to draw from public funds to support children of illicit unions. Given that passionate sexual impulses and behavior really are a constant in human affairs, most of us will encounter some legitimate illegitimate ancestors in our family lines. So these questions naturally follow. How do we determine that illegitimacy may be a factor in some of our lineages when families were trying so hard to cover it up? And once we know that we have persons born out of wedlock in our family, where do we look for answers about the circumstances, particularly their paternity, and sometimes their maternity? Before about the middle of the 11th century, the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate offspring was pretty blurry. That's because pre-Christian marriage customs had not yet been stamped out. It was common for people to have irregular relationships. Marriage was by personal agreement, and it could be dissolved at will by one of the individuals involved, usually the man so that a form of loose serial monogamy was the general rule. There was no expectation that marriage would necessarily endure for the lifetime of one of the partners. The Emperor Charlemagne, for example, who lived in the 8th and 9th centuries, had no fewer than four wives and five or more concubines at different times in his life. Formal marriage ceremonies sanctified by the representatives of the church were advisable but not necessary. In fact, clandestine marriages, those not involving a priest, were commonplace. The Catholic Church did not require that a priest be present for marriage until the Council of Trent in 1563, and clandestine marriages continued to be recognized in English common law until 1843. The fact that secret marriages were honored had to do with the church's insistence on consent of the bride and groom. In practical terms, however, making a personal choice could lead to fines or disinheritance, for, especially for the higher orders of society. Marriage was a financial and a political arrangement between families, and it was a difficult and courageous thing to follow your heart. 
For this reason, there was a lot of illegitimacy. Love was absent from most marriages and had to be sought elsewhere. Men have always had freer reign in this regard. For women, of course, especially propertied women, sexual intercourse outside marriage was intolerable. That's because the inheritance of property was at stake. Women of the lower orders had more leeway because property wasn't really a factor. It's estimated in one medieval village in England that for every two women who married, there was one illegitimate birth. In the early medieval context, most theologians didn't seem that interested in pontificating on marriage, although there were many parish-level priests who had wives and concubines. Clerical celibacy was not enforced on that level. But monastic influences were on the rise with St. Benedict and his successors. All sexual intercourse was polluting according to the divines of those days and reflected upon a person's inability to attain to the higher goal of celibacy. The union of male and female was never for carnal pleasure, according to the church, but an unfortunate necessity for perpetuating the human race. As St. Jerome wrote, he who is too ardently amorous of his wife is also an adulterer. With regard to the wife of another, in truth, all love is disgraceful. And with regard to one's own wife, excessive love is. The wise man must love his wife with judgment, not with passion. Nothing is more vile than to love a wife like a mistress. End of quote. The key components for creating a valid marriage were mutual consent, and mutual competency or eligibility, that is, not being previously promised to another, being of age, not being within prohibited degrees of relationship, and then finally it was dependent upon consummation. The key document was an agreement between the parents as to the marriage portion or dowry of the girl and the inheritance of the boy, and sometimes, of course, this, was, this agreement wasn't in writing especially if we're talking about ordinary people. Remember that parish registers were not kept in England systematically before the early 1500s. When there are no written records of marriage or formal ceremonies, it's very difficult to determine whether an individual is legitimate. And when it came to inheritance of property, illegitimacy was not necessarily a hindrance. Think of William the Conqueror, formerly known as William the Bastard, or Harold Harefoot, who was King Canute of Denmark's offspring by a morganatic or common law marriage, but who succeeded to the English throne in preference to his legitimate brother, Harda Canute, whose mother was a very high status woman. Then suddenly things began to change. Because of the Gregorian reforms of the 11th and 12th centuries and the work of canon lawyers like Gratian and Peter Lombard, the rules of marriage were more closely defined. The church began to emphasize uniformity of practice in marriage, customs, especially when it came to who could marry, declaration of the bans, what made a marriage valid or invalid, and it elevated marriage itself to where it stands now as one of the sacraments. It took a long time for individuals to adapt to these new expectations, but over time, the property classes in Europe, the men particularly, saw that it was to their advantage to accept church oversight of marriage and the family. It offered them a way to protect inheritances from the challenges of irregular heirs, to regulate sexual behavior of women, and to guarantee that their own lawfully born issue would inherit. For women, it provided a more stable family relationship and reliable support. A woman could not simply be renounced by her husband summarily without an annulment, which the Pope would have to grant. Uh, divorce, in the way that we see it today, of course, was simply impossible. To help enforce the canonical teachings on marriage, the church had to provide penalties for those who transgressed them. This includes punishments for adulterers and fornicators and making illegitimate children filius nullius, meaning the children of no one, for purposes of inheritance. Bastards, according to this law, could not inherit by right from either parent or from the kin of either parent from this point forward. The church courts oversaw all these matters, whether sexual crimes had been committed, whether children were bastards or not, if there was some question, in fact, almost any issue pertaining to personal morality or the family.
On some points, church law, which we call canon law, and the common law of England were in agreement. But there were several important points of difference when it came to base-born children. The most important of these was the case of mantle children, that is, those children born to a couple before a marriage took place. The name arises from the fact that by custom, these young ones were brought under the care cloth that was customarily spread over the heads of their parents during the marriage ceremony, and this act supposedly made them legitimate. The church honored this custom, but the barons of England refused it at the Parliament of Merton in 1235. For these children, legitimation had to be obtained by a special petition to the king and the payment of a fee. North Carolina continued to observe the common law practice, but there were other states that followed canon law. A second point of difference involved cases in which men refused to acknowledge children born to their wives as their own offspring. The church was committed to ferreting out the truth about the woman and admitted all kinds of evidence as to her character and behavior and with regard to the access of other men. The common law in England presumed that children born to the wife were the husband's children in almost all cases. There was an overriding concern that legitimate children should be protected from being summarily disinherited at a father's whim. There were only two grounds on which to contest this presumption. Non-access, called the beyond the seas gambit, in which the father was not present during a period of time in which a child could have been conceived, that is, at any time, ten months to a year prior to its birth, and proof of impotence, which involved humiliating public demonstrations for the man. Here again, the common law's attitude continued to be preserved in North Carolina. And finally, there was the question of how to look upon children born to a couple whose marriage had been annulled. Remember that no outright divorce was available in medieval times, so in order to dissolve a marriage, the fiction had to be preserved that no true marriage had ever taken place in the first place, usually on grounds of prior contract, on the grounds that the married parties were too closely related to one another, not just by blood, but also possibly by affinity or even spiritual relationships. In general, the courts held in prior contract cases that if one party was unaware that his or her partner had been married or promised to another, the children would remain legitimate. In cases of consanguinity, uh, it was presumed the parties were both aware and the children would be considered bastards. That is, if the parents were too closely related. That's what consanguinity means. So the sins of the father were indeed visited on the children. Charges of bastardy began to be used to question royal rights of succession in the later Middle Ages. Such smear campaigns were commonplace during the Wars of the Roses, in England, for example, and of course against the daughters of Henry VIII, Mary and Elizabeth. There were other disabilities that bastards suffered under law and custom. An illegitimate child of a craftsman was barred from joining his father's guild. Bastards were not allowed to take holy orders except by special dispensation from the Pope. On the other hand, after 1330, an illegitimate child of a female peasant who was bound to the land was freed from his mother's servile status. In point of fact, though, powerful men usually felt a need to provide for their acknowledged illegitimate children, sometimes making gifts of movable property to them, sometimes legitimizing them on petition to the king and making them their rightful heirs. In the wider society, through most of the Middle Ages, a bastard was not personally condemned, merely for the circumstances of the circumstances of his birth, but that was soon to change. At the end of the medieval period, the Tudor and Stuart eras had some rather ugly changes in store for illegitimate children. There are a lot of reasons. I think the main problem was the vast economic shifts that were taking place. In the 1500s and 1600s, you have the rise in importance and size of the middle class the movement of large numbers of people to cities, and the enclosure and improvement by landlords of properties that were formerly by custom for the common usage of average tenants. You also have a lot of people being expelled from the lands their families had held as tenants or serfs way back into the Middle Ages. 
landlords nobles gentry merchants were trying to exact every penny they could in income from the land the wool industry increasing in importance so less labor was required and more vacant land was needed for the grazing of sheep you also have a rebounding population after the conclusion of the black death so more people and fewer opportunities a classic 99 percent versus one percent problem this means that the numbers of illegitimate births became an issue since young people had to enter service or become wandering day laborers to support themselves all the time waiting later and later to get married and the number of poor vagrant people camping out in the byways and fields and sleeping in alleyways became a cause of concern for the better off these were the very conditions that led in large part to the settling of the atlantic seaboard with british colonists beginning in the early 1600s colonies were a safety valve for overpopulation and poverty and you also have to take into account the end of catholicism in england and the beginning of the anglican church for one thing monasteries which had been instrumental in relief of the poor were dissolved and their assets dispersed by henry the eighth to his own government himself and his supporters the poor quickly had no place to turn but panhandling the church courts did remain as did their capacity to judge matters of sexual propriety and family life but there was a new revulsion against sexual immorality and a feeling that the old way of punishing the violators usually by forcing them to do public penance wasn't harsh enough the emphasis on the children as the ne'er-do-well products of original sin is also striking so that suddenly they became objects of contempt and fear likely to fall into the same pitfalls of behavior as their parents now this idea becomes particularly prominent in the 1600s when puritanism became a powerful voice in english protestantism the emphasis was on personal piety and purity and the level of censoriousness towards sinners was never stronger above all there was a concern in local communities that the wandering poor were becoming a blight on society able-bodied beggars and vagabonds were variously placed in stocks warned or whipped out of the parish they could even be placed in houses of correction branded bored through the ear or under queen mary hung after initial warnings the innovations of queen elizabeth were a humanitarian improvement over these punitive measures it was her innovation and systematization of public relief that led directly to the bastardy system that we had here in North Carolina. By the terms of poor laws enacted under Queen Elizabeth between the 1570s and the first decade of the 17th century, parishes, the smallest ecclesiastical unit of government served by a single vicar or parish priest, became responsible through poor rates levied on property holders for supporting poor people who had a right of residence in that place, um, usually defined as the parish in which they were born, married, or apprenticed. That included poor women who had children born out of wedlock. However, the church wardens and vestrymen of the parish who oversaw poor relief could also question whether an individual had a right of residency. If not, they could shift that person elsewhere. They could also involve the civil authorities, the justices of the peace, and ask that the woman be examined and questioned about the father's identity. Sometimes the midwife would be instructed not to assist the woman in childbirth until she revealed the name of the father. That was called an inquisition in extremis. If she did agree to make these, the accusation, the man could be brought before the justice, and the justice would then and there have the power to decide whether he was truly the father if he was determined to be guilty or if he admitted the charge then he could be forced to pay lying in costs for the woman and upkeep costs for the child until the child was of age to be placed as a servant in one of the parishioners households usually between the ages of seven and ten both father and mother could be consigned to a house of correction for a year and whipped or fined as a punishment for the illicit act of conceiving the child. 
anyone who concealed an illegitimate birth, even a family member, could be subjected to fines and corporal punishment. Also, of course, the filius nullius principle still applied, child of no one. The child could not inherit from either the father or the mother or their kin. It was as if the child had no family. It might seem obvious that such a system would discourage illegitimacy, but in point of fact, as long as the economic conditions in England were poor, bastardy really didn't decline that much. It stayed pretty constant at 2 to 3% of births in that era, with occasional spikes upward. Of course, there is a question as to whether that is an underestimate. It's based purely on mentions of baptisms of illegitimate children recorded in parish registers. That doesn't take into account all the illegitimate births that were concealed or went unreported, uh, and that is, unbaptized children, pregnancies that weren't carried to term, and there was, of course, high infant mortality at that time. The poor laws did have unfortunate consequences for illegitimate children. It meant that parishes engaged in a game of hot potato. There were vestrymen who paid to have mothers and children moved to other parishes so that their own would not be liable. Frequently, mothers would travel away from home to give birth to illegitimate children in an attempt to protect their family's reputations. When they discovered uh, the child would have to remain in its own parish of birth and the mother returned to hers, uh, thus separating the two, if they were not separated, the county might place mother and child in an almshouse or workhouse together. The workhouses were notoriously filthy, drafty, disease, and vice-ridden places, and many people didn't survive them. Fathers were also sometimes inclined to urge abortions on their pregnant lovers, to steal their children and transport them elsewhere, to, or to pay others to do it, to lie their heads off about their relationship, sometimes even to conspire at infanticide or abandonment. But even if a child was born healthy, and that was not so common for poor women of that era, in all likelihood, that child would not be committed to the care of its mother during the period when the father was to provide support. Usually the young one was handed over to a paid nurse, who was in the game solely for the money. Many children committed to the care of nurses were abandoned. Many died in neglect. The mortality rates were appalling. These conditions led to the formation of foundling hospitals in many major cities, principally London. Such refuges were supported by charitable gifts or private endowments. They were much more humane places, and competition to get into them was high, but mortality in them was still about 50%. Still, obviously, they couldn't compete with the care that a family would give. The mother did have to give up seeing the child again, though some mothers occasionally sent money or gifts. There are some truly sad little tokens, like you see here, that were left by mothers to their children to remember them by, usually something like a button, a key, a bit of lace or ribbon, maybe a charm or a little toy. If you visit one of the hospital museums today, you'll see these. And then, if the child did survive to be bound as a servant, he or she could expect a long, late childhood and adolescence full of cruelty, bare sustenance, and overwork. Of course, with no inheritance, one could not expect a good start in life. Those of us who can claim 17th or 18th century English immigrant ancestors to America, particularly ones who were transported at early ages without other family members as indentured servants, should expect that they may have been born bastards. Transportation was another way of getting rid of them. So that brings us to conditions in the colonies, and our focus here, of course, is North Carolina. The common law traditions of England we've been discussing applied to the colonies, but the colonial legislatures did make modifications, and so long as these were not overruled by the crown, they were allowed. North Carolina created its first bastardy provisions in two laws of 1741, one entitled an act for the better observation and keeping of the Lord's Day, commonly called Sunday, and for the more effectual suppression of vice and immorality, and an act concerning servants and slaves, 
The first basically reiterated the law as it stood in England, accepting only that there were no effective Anglican parishes in North Carolina. This meant that the matter of public support based on tithes was totally in the hands of county authorities, and only the justices of the peace were involved. Two justices together constituted a sufficient court to examine a woman, summon the accused man, and determine his guilt. If the woman refused to cooperate, she could be fined, and then she would have to find someone to give security that they would support the child. Sometimes this would be the actual father, and sometimes a family member or friend. North Carolina also allowed that the child and the mother should not be separated, so whatever county the mother had residency in, the child was eligible for public support there, no matter where it was born. She was usually able to keep the child in her own custody until he reached the age of between 5 and 10. If there was still apprehension that the child would not receive sufficient support until majority, he or she could be bound out as an apprentice to someone in the neighborhood, a system just like the one in England, until 18 for females and 21 for males. A trade was specified, a bare level of literacy education, and minimal freedom dues, for example, a suit of clothes and perhaps a horse. Children who could not work might be farmed out by the poorhouse a mercenary system just like the one that involved the hiring of nurses in England. The less you spent on the child from what was allotted, the more profits you made. The second law I mentioned about servants arose from the fact that many poor young women had to bind themselves out as laborers to plantation owners to keep body and soul together. It was held that becoming pregnant deprived the masters of these women of their labor an idea that's very similar to the one that we mentioned about the lawsuit between Duncan McRae and Henry, Henry Lilly. So any woman that became pregnant during her servitude would have her term extended by a year to make up for the time she couldn't work when she was pregnant. If the master was father of the bastard by his serving woman, as so frequently happened, the church wardens would sell her for an additional year's service to another master after her indenture ended and the proceeds proceeds would go to the parish. If the illegitimate child was a mixed race, and remember that all interracial marriages were outlawed by this time, then the woman would have to serve an additional two years, and the child could be bound to serve until age 31 as an indentured servant. This kind of enforced servitude was tantamount to slavery, which leads to another special burden placed on free people of color. Any man of color who could not afford to pay support for a child of which he had been convicted as the father could be bound out for a term of service and the proceeds of his labor would be used to support the child. Penalties of this kind were not imposed on white fathers, by the way. The story from here is a tale of gradual alleviation of some of the harsh strictures on the women and their children. Increasingly, through the 19th century, the women were not uniformly labeled harlots. Many were thought of as women who had made mistakes or had been seduced. Popular culture played a role here, like the many 18th century novels of seduced parlor maids by Swift, Fielding, or Richardson. Nor were the children thought to be tainted and unworthy of consideration. Victorians, under the influence of Enlightenment philosophers like Rousseau, no longer thought of children as miniature adults or exponents of original sin, and began to think of childhood as a time of innocence, perfectly suited to freedom, exploration, and wonder. In 1799, an act of the legislature permitted illegitimate children to inherit from the mother if she had no legitimate children, and the illegitimate children could also inherit from one another, but they still could not inherit from her parents or siblings. The mother could inherit from her illegitimate child if there were no other illegitimate children. In 1805, the crime of fornication and adultery became indictable at law. This was a criminal action designed to punish sexual misconduct, and it's usually a criminal case state versus the woman and the man. Bastardy, on the other hand, was always considered a civil action in which the state had an interest, and it is usually phrased 
in the title of the case is state and the woman versus the man, or sometimes just state versus the man, which makes it look like a criminal action, but it's really a civil action in which the state has a key interest. It was designed to punish sexual misconduct. There was a statute of limitations, however. Charges had to be brought within three years of the child's birth. The fact that bastardy was a civil matter was a very important distinction in the prosecution of the alleged father. It made it much easier to convict him. He did not have a right to a jury trial in North Carolina until 1814 to determine his innocence. Before that, the justices of the peace had sole authority to determine the matter, and even after 1814, if he was acquitted by one jury, his case could be appealed by the prosecutor to the superior court. Furthermore, the burden was always on the man to disprove the woman's allegation, something that isn't allowed in criminal cases. Unless he could do that on a small number of grounds, like inadmissibility of her testimony, or proving that he had not been intimate with her at the time of conception, the presumption of guilt remained. He couldn't simply say that other men had had sex with her, or cite her reputation for immorality or unreliability. For this reason, few men really offered a defense. They found a security and posted a bond to keep the child, or sometimes they just left the county or state. This is important. It should warn us to not to take everything in the bastardy materials for granted. In 1829, the county superior courts gained full competency in legitimating base-born children. By 1838, county courts could also do this. Formerly, this had been only possible by a private act of the legislature. An act of legitimation could only proceed if the father made the petition acknowledging the children as his own. He could only do this if he married the mother or if she later moved out of state, was herself married to another person, or had died. He himself could not have been married to someone other than the mother when the children were born. Because there was no valid marriage under slavery, a law was passed legitimating the children of all slave couples whether or not they were able to register their unions after slavery ended, so long as they cohabited until the death of one of them. When property was at stake, some interesting cases could arise in courts trying to define the family arrangements of slaves, subject as they were to the will of the master. Who could move them at will, sell them, or force them to take new sexual partners? In 1933, the system of bastardy inquisition ended in North Carolina. Subsequently, suits for support were only brought at the will of the mother, and increasingly, paternity could be verified or disproved through blood tests, and now, of course, DNA. The Departments of Social Services, rather than Justices of the Peace, became the prime movers in the new system. In 1959, illegitimate, illegitimate children became fully capable of inheriting from intestate mothers and siblings from the same mother, whether legitimate or illegitimate, also from the broader kin group of their mothers. And in the period from 1973 to 1977, illegitimate children who were acknowledged by their fathers or who could get a judgment affirming the identity of their father could inherit from him and his kin group. However, the claim had to be made within six months of public notice to creditors. Likewise, the father's other children were enabled to inherit from an illegitimate child who died without heirs. So here's a question that we mentioned at the beginning. If families were often so keen to conceal the misdeeds of their sons and daughters, how do we know that we may have an illegitimate child in our lineage? Well, here are several ways in which we can tell. One, the child's age falls well before the date of the alleged parent's marriage. Secondly, the child's residence within the family shifts. The child seems not to be living with parents, but perhaps with other relatives, like grandparents or aunts, who may even allege that the child is theirs. Thirdly, the child is simply not mentioned in census records at all, 
even though we know that they were present in a given household. Fourthly, the child is bound out as an apprentice, even though family members remain in the neighborhood. Remember that some apprentices, however, are just impoverished orphans, not bastards. Fifthly, the child lives with a mother, but it cannot be shown that the mother was married prior to its birth, even though she may claim when asked to be widowed or divorced. Sixthly, the child does not seem to be listed as an heir when someone we assume she should inherit from dies without a will. In the seventh place, the stories of the child's parentage either in the records or as handed down in the family tend to be inconsistent and can't be verified with records from the time of the child's birth. And last, the child is attributed to someone who could not possibly be his or her father or mother, or to a person who doesn't seem to have existed at all. Records from around the time the child was born are liable to be more forthcoming and exact than family traditions when it comes to this matter. The child him or herself is less likely to know or be forthcoming in later years because of the stigma, but some could be quite honest and open about it, so don't discount what they claim entirely. I find that African Americans were more often open about informal relationships and actual parents than white families, unless there was a cross-racial tie, and even then, they might have been more open in private. One good source is family traditions. For example, in my family, it was quite openly told by my grandmother that her own grandmother had an illegitimate child, and she identified the name of the father for me. I was able to find that individual, and DNA evidence has since confirmed that he was indeed the father of her child. Vital records. Check what parents are claimed in marriage licenses, birth certificates, death certificates. Sometimes the answers given could be partially true. Thirdly, bastardy bonds. Now these are separated into a bond record series at the North Carolina State Archives by County, and they're arranged chronologically. So knowing about when your ancestor would have been conceived and when he or she was born is key. Also, the statute of limitations was three years, so search up to four years after the conception. You should not expect to find the child's name, although that can happen, but certainly the mother's name, the alleged father's name, and the name of the bondsman, sometimes the child's sex, and whether yet born, and if born, sometimes, very rarely, the date of birth will be given. Sometimes witness testimony is given, but that's quite rare. Note that there were also appearance bonds mixed in with the bastardy bonds in which alleged fathers agreed to appear in court to answer the charge, and records of examination of the woman for which a warrant to apprehend the alleged father is often attached. There were also sometimes executions for unpaid child support against the alleged father's property. Another often overlooked category of records that can help are criminal or civil action papers. Strangely, even though bastardy is not a criminal action, you'll more often find papers that haven't been carefully separated into the bastardy bonds category in the criminal action papers. That's because many actions are entitled state and the woman versus the alleged father, or just state versus the alleged father. And they just seem more criminal than civil to most people, even archivists, who should know better. But if a sufficient volume of criminal and civil action papers have survived, and you haven't found evidence elsewhere, like in the bastardy records, I really suggest you look through these act criminal and civil actions for the appropriate time period around the birth. I found many criminal actions related to bastardy in Randolph County, where I've done the most work on this particular category of records. There are also other types of criminal action papers that might reveal or suggest parentage. The best known of these we've already mentioned, prosecutions for fornication and adultery, but also for unlawful cohabitation, 
where people are being charged for living together out of wedlock, for keeping a disorderly house, uh, for the women in particular, or various sexual assaults, which could have resulted in pregnancy. And assaults actually um, are often not specified to be sexual in nature, but when you see a man assaulting a woman, you should keep in mind when they're unrelated that it could have been uh, a sexual attack. In some cases, when folks just lived together, they were not prosecuted for bastardy because the man was already doing his duty by his children. Upkeep wasn't the issue. Perhaps the man or woman was just unable to regularize the relationship because one or the other couldn't obtain a divorce. And divorces were very rare in North Carolina in the 19th century, as they were in most other places in the country. Keep in mind, too, that sexual assaults often look like simple assaults. There are civil actions for damages, like the one Duncan McRae brought against Henry Lilly, but these are pretty rare. And also remember there are civil actions for slander, which may involve some kind of irregular relationship being bandied about in the community in gossip. Another potential source, county court minutes. Sometimes loose papers just haven't survived and the only record of a bastard proceeding will be in the court's minutes. These minutes usually are more abbreviated than the bonds, but they will usually give you the father's name and maybe the mother as well. Uh, if the case went to trial, it will definitely appear in the minutes, but you have to remember that many matters of this nature were handled summarily before a magistrate and were never brought into court, and therefore they will never appear in the court minutes. Apprentice records, both as loose bonds and in court minutes, often mention the mother of an illegitimate child and state clearly that the child was considered a bastard. Unfortunately, these do not reveal the father's name. Wardens of the poor records often mention poor base-born children who fell under their care, either as inmates of the poorhouse or as persons assigned to members of the community for room and board. But again, these will not reveal paternity. And finally, one other that isn't listed here are church minutes. There are some churches that discipline members for irregular sexual activity, like the Quaker Church or the Primitive Baptist Church, and you sometimes will find evidence of illegitimacy there. Remember, however, that there are many, many cases in which illegitimacies are not documented in the public record. Some families and some women were extremely successful in concealing children or passing off the children of other men as those of a husband. Women from wealthier families were less likely to be hauled before the justices than poorer ones because of the sway that their family held among the county officials and because their children were unlikely be to become public charges anyway. And remember, that's really what the, the, the real reason and justification for the state intervening in these situations to keep the children from becoming public charges. Some records simply don't survive, particularly those that were never turned in by a justice of the peace, which was very common. It's very common for justices to have public records still in their personal papers when they die, and those might never be turned over. Or there are records that were taken from the courthouse by embarrassed descendants, believe me. Some courthouses have simply suffered losses from fire or flood or actions in time of war. Others have simply thrown out old records to conserve space. And then to Enforcement was almost non-existent in certain times and places, such as on the frontier in the colonial period. In some instances, African Americans were less likely to be prosecuted for bastardy than whites in the latter 19th century. It really just depends on the locality and the attitude of the public officials there. So what do you do in such cases? Well, when in doubt, DNA.
may even wish to take the step to confirm what the records are telling you because not every woman really knew who the father of her child was or wanted to tell who the child's father was. Or they simply picked a wealthier man to accuse who had the wherewithal to support the child. There are two types of DNA that could be useful. Why DNA testing? That's helpful when an illegitimate child was male and had a direct line of male descendants, son to grandson to great-grandson, etc., one of whom you can contact and persuade to test today. These are people you, who usually have that illegitimate child's surname. This tests the Y chromosome, which only males carry and which only they can pass to their sons. The test is cheaper than the autosomal option, and if you can find a match in a legitimate male lineage descended from the suspected father's family, it can confirm your suspicions or the allegations in the documents that you've found. Of course, there can't be any other non-paternity events in the generation between the testee and the male whose father you're trying to confirm. That's actually incorrect. This test is much more expensive than the autosomal test. Um, at the time I wrote this originally, that was quite the opposite because autosomal testing was relatively new. Now, autosomal testing can be performed on males or females who descend from the illegitimate child, and it is available from various services like 23andMe or Family Tree DNA or Ancestry DNA. The autosomes are, are the 22 pairs of chromosomes other than the sex chromosomes, and they're tested at around 700,000 locations that tend to differ among human beings since we share most of our DNA with each other because we're from the same species. Basically, there's an attempt to match your DNA to those of closer cousins, usually those who have common great-great-grandparents or more recent common ancestors, but more and more segments are being tested now, and so distant cousinages do appear and can be detectable. The test measures the links of DNA that you share with other people in the databases and predicts how closely you're kin to them. So if you share enough DNA with the family of the father of the person you suspect to be an illegitimate child, or, and someone from that family also retains enough of that DNA and has been tested, it will show up as a match. Perhaps shame is the greatest barrier to pursuing this line of inquiry. It's relatively easy to fall into the trap of thinking that your ancestors should have lived to a higher standard than people commonly do today. It's important not to feel threatened by what you find, but just to be grateful that you are able to discern the facts at this distance and that research can continue. Remember that you're no less related to a family simply because the ties weren't sanctified by marriage. Some folks are also consoled by the fact that they're likely to find more prominent ancestors in the lineage of the father than the mother of the child. Just remember that at this remove, it's impossible to know the exact circumstances of that relationship. There are often factors that would help you to make sense of the actions and decisions of your forebears if you could simply ask them a few questions. Also consider what obstacles the children and their families overcame in making good lives for themselves. In general, I find that my respect for my ancestors only increases when I delve into the hardships that they endured and the challenges that they surmounted, even when these involved criminal or civil proceedings.